everyone, Devin Greer, and it's been quite some time since we've done any type of show, so, you know, sitting here and went and looked at the YouTube page and saw all of the views that I've been getting, and I said, you know, maybe maybe make it, make one that I've been talking about doing for a while, a battle of the open source web browsers. Now, I know you guys are sitting there probably looking going, oh, Devin, the one you got in the background here, it's not, it's not open source, and I'll cover in a minute why Vivaldi's on the screen. Um, so... The main reason that we, we, you know, part of what I like to do is some form of app pick. And I think that I've done Vivaldi in the past. I can't recall. Um, but, you know, being that we're covering open source web browsers, we can't really put Vivaldi into the, uh, the mix of competition. But we can do it as an app pick because, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Linux and open source and the internet is being at the internet is primarily mostly built on um, open standards. Um, we've always had really good luck with support with web browsers. You know, when you look at like a lot of other applications, we've always, I don't want to say been lacking. We've had our open source competitors, but, you know, we don't always have the, um, uh, you know, like we don't have Photoshop. Um, we don't have light or, uh, well, we do have Lightworks. No, we don't have Lightworks, uh, but numerous proprietary pieces of application like Office and so on, we've never had. So, um, but web browsers have always been kind of interesting because, you know, we have Chrome, we have Firefox, we have uh, this Vivaldi web browser. There's numerous ones actually available on Linux that aren't even available on the proprietary OS vendors. Um, but I think Vivaldi's kind of has an interesting story because essentially uh, the people who created Opera, are uh, the original creators of Opera are now building Vivaldi uh, with no attachments to Opera. And, and it's interesting because I remember the first time I used Opera about five, six years ago, it was one of the most revolutionary web browsers I had ever touched. Uh, there are things that I saw five, six years ago, maybe even more, maybe more like six, seven years ago, uh, that were in Opera that eventually uh, Firefox and Chrome started using and I was like, oh, come on. I mean, that that's straight from Opera. So I'm kind of hoping to see Vivaldi maybe set some patterns because Opera kind of, you know, when you look at it in terms of market share and relevance, you don't really hear people say, oh, yeah, I use Opera. Um, you hear a lot of people say, yeah, I've used Opera at one time and it was great. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're, well, I use Firefox. I use um uh, Chrome, or I'm sure even by it, at this point in 2015, if you're a Windows user, you, you're probably more likely going to find Microsoft Edge users than you will over Opera. So um, now from what I do know, Vivaldi is a proprietary web browser platform. Um, I definitely recommend go the, to the website and kind of check out their uh, video that they have here. Um, what's interesting is they're trying to build a web browser that is for the powerhouse web browser user. They kind of go into the video and they talk about how today's web browsers have been simplified. But just like anything, when you simplify something, um, the amount of tools that you have to your availability are pretty minimal. Um, you know, you can customize everything. Uh, there's quick commands, very interesting. Tab stacks and tiling. Um, write notes on the go. And then, you know, built for the web with the web. Okay. Um, and, you know, they just go through all these different things. Now, uh, when it comes term to, down to the, to the customization function, uh, you know, we can say, okay, display all. You can set default. You can do your startup, your appearance, right, left side uh, for your controls. Um, for GNOME users who are big on the dark theme, you do have a dark theme uh, ability, which is kind of nice. Or, <clears throat> you know, for the Windows users who are maybe watching this show wanting to use a superior operating system, and I know there are probably some Windows user who's going to post a horrible comment below now. I'm challenging you. Um, you know, I know like uh, Edge has this ability, so this is probably a very popular option. It, there's just a lot. Now, I mean, to be honest with you, some of these things, a lot of this can be done in other web browsers, mm -hmm. but this is still a beta browser, so it is going to be interesting where they're going to take it. Um, something I did find interesting is there's a lot of stuff that you can build in here, but a lot of it isn't ready yet. Now, what is interesting, if I have reviewed this before, because I have been following Vivaldi for about a year now, maybe more or less, um, a lot of this stuff has been marked coming soon for some time. And so I kind of sit back and I kind of go, okay, you guys want to keep my interest, I need to actually start seeing more active development. Okay, um, 
it looks like they are actively working on it. I'm just not seeing functions come. Um, and then the other question I have is I'm curious how this is going to work. I really don't want to, you know, I don't know how I feel about attaching more of my accounts to something or creating new accounts for something. This is going to be interesting. Now, the other thing I am very curious for, and I don't know if I found a good answer yet, being proprietary, the question is always, you have to pay developers because you don't have people willing to work on this at no cost, minimal cost, or some form of other payment method. You want people who want a physical cash revenue. So I haven't seen yet with Vivaldi, what is their business method? If they're gonna try and do what Opera was doing, and then if, if for those of you old enough to remember Netscape, um, and try and sell a enterprise level web browser to companies, um, I'm probably betting this is not gonna be a long-term web browser. That's why you don't see many paid for web browsers these days. Now, in terms of how it did, uh, 521 out of 555 points that's pretty respectable and the flash benchmark was actually the most interesting and at the end of the video we'll come back and explain why the flash benchmark was like the most interesting out of all of them okay so to move on we're actually gonna go with seniority and I know some of you are like ah we're going Chrome well can't do Chrome because it's proprietary but we can look at chromium okay now Chromium, in my opinion, doesn't have seniority in terms of market share because I do think Chrome and Chromium market share are two different things. But the other thing is, let's go with the oldest web browser, and that is Firefox. So let's hop over, and I'll show you guys that demo here in a minute. But let's look at Firefox. Firefox is this um, web browser that has been around for, uh, man, I mean, I remember putting Firefox on XP boxes. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know the history and are partially interested, uh, Firefox actually originates from Netscape. Net, yet again, some of us are old enough to remember using Netscape on a Mac uh, back in the you know, mid 90s, mid to late 90s. Um, and I'm talking about in the public schools, I'm not a big Mac person, but that was before it was actually even OS X. Uh, but it basically what happened was they had a proprietary business model and uh, I think they made money in enterprise. I don't know if it cost or was free for the consumer side. But the problem is, is when Microsoft shipped Internet Explorer, people were like, why would I pay for a web browser? But in order to stop Microsoft from having complete control over the, uh, the web, um, Netscape, before they took their final breath and died, released their source code and created the Mozilla Foundation. And to this day, uh, from what I've read, uh, Firefox has never had a dominant market share. But they do still have a large enough market share where it is considered a relevant web browser. Okay. Um, you know, you can come in and look at the history of the forums, the governance. They are 100% open source. Uh, I think this is the about page. Um, you know, Firefox, the other nice thing is, you know, you can put it on your Android or I believe they also, yep, iOS. Um, and then that way, when you bookmark something on your desktop and then like later you're talking to someone, you can open up your Firefox on your phone and do it. Uh, we're not going to go over the phones OS's today, um, but, uh, you know, I will kind of throw a quick out there. Uh, I love Firefox on my phone, but in terms of rendering pages, Chrome has had it beat for some time. Um, and it, the one huge aspect that I love about Firefox is the customized function. And you kind of get that, that Vivaldi aspect. Um, I'm assuming you can get additional tools and features. I'll be straight with you guys. I'm one of those that's a very simple web browser user. user. Um, but you know, you can come in, an example being, I this is what I like to have as my primary search bar. So I don't believe I need a search function that's very old and archaic in my eyes. Um, I do like to see, oftenly, uh, the sync. <clears throat> which is nice because if I save something and you're like me and you're always, you, you kind of trust cloud, but not a hundred percent. It's nice to see that thing start spinning and you know, okay, I've got that done. Um, the other nice function that Firefox has highly worked on over the years is their, their, their cloud service. Um, you know, back in the day, I remember like Firefox, not back in the day, like two years ago, Firefox had this horrible sync function. It was just constantly painful. 
And if you needed to pull data from one machine over to another, it could be done, but you had to use like these keys. And I mean, to be honest with you, it was probably the most secure method possible. But I think what Firefox found was end users don't care really much about security. They should, but you can't force them to. If you make something too hard, they'll go elsewhere. So they went to more of a Chrome style uh, and you can quickly create an account or if you already have one, you can go here. One complaint I really have is I understand why they take you to the create your account first deal, but now I have one more click to do. You know what, set it up where I log in and then at the bottom somewhere down here, put in create account. People are typically used to that standard. Okay. Uh, the the flash benchmark now <clears throat> um, the flash benchmark uh, Firefox did really well now what's the thing about Firefox is it uses uh, it, it, it does have Adobe flash if you pull the package down for us arch users Ubuntu if you opt to install the third-party proprietary packages in the installation uh, you have flash by default um, it's using flash 11.2 or 11.4 I can't remember the package number it's a very old version of flash now that doesn't mean it's not secure I mean flash is not secure by design but um, it is actively receiving security patches until 2017 which I think that is kind of Adobe's way of saying we're predicting to be long gone and dead by that point uh, not Adobe as a company but the flash product I mean over this last year YouTube has gone to a complete HTML5 um, and many other tools like another one that I always use is uh, speedtest.net they are, have recently gone to a full HTML so um, I, I really think that it's just a matter of time so but for those who have a website who still heavily rely uh, relies on Adobe Flash and I am one of them my uh, student college portal uh, many things are rendered in flash so I kind of need it um, in order to go to college so but it does work here um, you know you're able to go in and you're able to put in a menu bar if you're old-fashioned uh, bookmark toolbar and uh, then you're able to build out a bunch of bookmarks into here um, you've got your, you know, your traditional things. Some people have kind of pointed out how uh, Firefox has gone to these like curved uh, tabs, and that's very Chrome of them. But I still say that there's a lot of customization and a lot of modernness to the 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 thing of fire to what Firefox is. Uh, that quite frankly, if I'm going to depict it as a Chrome clone by just putting curved tabs, it's pretty a pretty shallow view. Um, Firefox has undergone some huge changes over the last year. So a big one that is coming is uh, add-ons. Well, they are um, slowly moving to extensions. Now, I don't know how that's going to work for them. I don't know if they're making it easy uh, to port. I'm not a developer, but something made them say, we're done with add-ons. We're going to move to an extension model, just like what Google Chrome's using. Um, there has been many other under the hood things that they have changed. So example being Firefox, when you used to open up Firefox and say have 10 tabs open, all those tabs used to run under one process, okay? Um, it was really good for resource management. You didn't have a browser consuming a ton of resources. The problem was is if a tab crashed, so did the browser, okay? Now it's not to say that Firefox now can't crash, but it went to more of a Chrome style or Chromium style uh, process management where the browser is a process and each tab is a individual process so if a tab crashes then no big deal now if the main browser process crashes then the system still goes with it now the other aspect to that is there's a performance kernels whether it's Windows Linux uh, BSD Unix it doesn't matter if you have a browser taking on too many resources the kernel is designed to question any application that's receiving too many and too much in resources so yet again using a multi-process for the tabs is a better method because then the kernel doesn't get so upset that was a big complaint with performance on the older versions of Firefox that has been fixed over the last say 12 to 24 months is the performance on Firefox is almost on par with um, Chrome or Chromium in our case that we'll be looking at today. Um, the other nice thing is the themes. I will definitely say that Firefox, and it may be just because it's been around longer, has a lot more themes or it's easier for me to search for themes that I enjoy using than uh, Chromium or Chrome. 
So that's been definitely um, something I really enjoy about the browser. And you know, at one time, Firefox was the dominant browser in open source browsing, and we had a plethora of browsers that were just um, spin-offs of Firefox. Today, the only one I actually still hear about is Pale Moon. Um, primarily among the Windows community. I know that Pale Moon uh, recently had, in the last year, done a port to Linux. Um, and I don't know, Pale Moon's kind of weird. Like, it feels like Firefox, looks like Firefox, but doesn't update the same as Firefox. So um, the, the last thing that, you know, we'd really like to go into is like the preferences. The thing that uh, I think where Firefox puts the, the icing on the cake, overall best out of everything, right, is that Firefox has uh, the cleanest option menu of like all time. I can easily go through these settings and quickly move around. Ah, I'm glad I came to this page. One thing I will point out that I've not been happy with, um, with Mozilla is picking the Yahoo search engine. I get why they did it. Google was getting a clear monopoly on the search place. But, you know, quite frankly, end users don't care. I mean, honestly, I would have rather have seen them pick DuckDuckGo, who probably just didn't have the money that they were wanting. Uh, for a default search engine, or I would have even if it would have been a little less for them to go with Bing. To me, that is light years better than picking Yahoo because I almost never get a relevant search on Yahoo. I have gotten relevant searches on Bing, and even DuckDuckGo, I get really nice searches. So personally, yes, I can change it, but I wouldn't have picked Yahoo, even if they offered three times the amount of money. You, you just you got to have standards here at some point, right? Uh, you know, you can go into the privacy, you can go into the security and the sync and the advanced and come in. And I, I mean, there's a lot in which you can do here. And there are functions of uh, Firefox that I have used, uh, example being pairing, uh, doing certain functions with Putty that I think maybe Chromium could do, but I've always just found the, the, the instructions uh, through Firefox. Um, the the other huge component is um, they do have um, pretty much they cover all the, the the main audio video codecs they have um, a PDF viewer um, and then one thing that I wanted to show real quick because I thought it was kind of cool it's been out for a few years but I noticed there's not a lot of talk about it and it's probably because it never went past demo um, was something called banana bread. Uh, so banana, the banana bread project was basically showing that you can create gorgeous interactive games using HTML5 back when everyone was still doing it with Flash. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I want to quit. Um, it, real quick, I don't really care for showing and demoing games, but this was something that was kind of uh, cool. And then, like I said, I think I remember hearing about this like two years ago. And as you guys can tell, for an HTML5 game, this is gorgeous. In fact, I this is almost um, like Unity uh, 3D engine gorgeous. I've never even seen anything this beautiful in Flash, and allegedly this game is fully built. The game is fully built um, out of HTML5. It was a big, big uh, showpiece for Firefox saying, stop writing in Flash. Well, I don't think this helped the death of Flash. I think Flash just sucking as a product helped the death of Flash. So next we're going to look at Chromium. So let's find it. Let's find it. So Chromium is the open source version of Google Chrome. Now, when Chromium first came about, it was a very rough start, I think. Um, you were using the Mozilla Flash plugin. You're using a ton of Netscape plugins. It did not have a PDF viewer. It was just a horrible, horrible experience. The only reason you used Chromium was it was lightweight, it was fast, and it seamlessly attached to your Google account. Okay. Now, a lot has changed since then. You now can use the Pepper Flash plugin. It does not come in Chromium by default. You have to go through your repositories. Um, Ubuntu, it's a simple find the plugin, put a check mark in the box, and hit install in the App Center. Uh, in Arch, just find the AUR package and install, and it seamlessly integrates into it. Um, the And I know some of you are like, well, it, oh man, at that point, why don't I just use Google Chrome? Well, if you've been following over the last several months, there was an article posted about um, Google and being able to do that Hey Google function um, to your laptop when you were on the Google page. And it would be able to listen and do all that stuff. Well, one of the Chromium developers discovered that it was either expo very exploitable via 
uh, malicious code, or that Google at any given point was able to listen into a room conversation at any point. So I, I'm still a big believer that if you do need to use some proprietary products like Flash, it is better to take an open source platform and integrate small little chunks of proprietary pieces in it and go that route than to say, well, I mean, if I'm going to use all this stuff, I might as well use a full proprietary platform because it's going to integrate more seamlessly. Not necessarily the truth. Um, and I think part of the reason that Pepper became such a big component of Chromium is in the event that Flash doesn't die by 2017 and there's a Linux user that's going to heavily need Flash, it's nice to at least have a web browser that we can still recommend. Now, if we go to the HTML5 test, 521. Now, if I go back and look at Firefox, 466. <clears throat> now, I have ran these tests several times. Um, and the numbers are generally consistent. Firefox in three different tests scored about uh, roughly around a 466, never even got close to the 500 marker. And Chromium stayed around 520 to 525 and um, it stayed well above the 500 marker. So this is just to see how well does uh, Chromium handle HTML5 code. Um, kind, of, kind of important. Uh, the Flash benchmark, um, yet again, just like Firefox. Now, you see that there's a frame rate in Ultra, but if it goes below a certain frame rate, and I want to say it's below 60, uh, it actually fails the test. So Chromium didn't make Ultra, neither did Firefox. Now, what was interesting, now let's go back to the Firefox aspect, and let's go back to the Flash benchmark. Actually, it scored higher in the first two than Chrome, Chromium, and da, 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 Chromium and scored higher even the third. Now it did really bad on Ultra. Now I, I found this interesting because Chromium is using Pepper, which is up to date with the latest version of Flash. Firefox on an older version of Flash actually saw better performance. Relatively interesting. Now could be Flash Benchmark TAC 08. This might be a, a tester from 2008. It was just the one I found that most people were using. So maybe. It's just because the version of Flash that's being used in Chromium is too new. I cannot guarantee that. Uh, Chromium also has a very interesting not so much page. Um, you know, if you look, they actually have like ads to actually go get Chrome, which I kind of found interesting. Um, and this is more of, I don't, I don't know, it's like very interesting because like Chromium's page reminds me of like a very boring developer page. Um, it's, the, the thing I can't answer today, I've looked, I haven't seen any really good answers on it, is if Chromium is literally just an open source fork of Chrome, or if Chrome is based on Chromium. You know, it's kind of like the Fedora and Red Hat relationship. Now, both are open source, yes, but Red Hat is essentially based off a lot of the core technologies developed in Fedora earlier on. Okay, so Fedora goes, they build it, yay. When it's stable and good, Red Hat takes it. I can't say if that's the difference between Chrome and Chromium. Um, in terms of how you can set everything up, I will say that when it comes time to find like incognito mode, uh, history, downloads, everything's nice and simple. Um, we can go to the settings page. Now, this is where I think Chromium takes like this huge dive into the abyss. Their settings page sucks. It is horrible. You know, you can go into extensions. Yep, I don't have any. Um, history, you know, I can see a little bit of that. Settings, though, I mean, it gives you a very simplistic layout, which isn't too bad. But then if you have to go into the advanced settings, you're doing this like, it almost, it is like as bad as using the old Windows start menus, right? Click here, go here, go here. You're constantly diving deeper and deeper, but you have to because it's not all very readily present and available in front of you. Half the problem that you will suffer from when doing that type of setup and method, well, if you don't know where it's at, you're not gonna be able to easily find it. That is half the problem with Chromium. So I'm not very happy about their settings page. There's not as much power into them. And then if you do use Chromium onto another, um, uh, another operating system of choice, uh, some of those settings are actually very dependent on the internal components of the operating system. 
So that's been kind of weird. Um, so now we go here, a web browser built for speed, simplicity, and security. Now, uh, Chromium is made possible by the Chromium open source project and other open source software. Now, what I do find interesting is if you actually open up Google Chrome, it still says uh, they give somewhere in there a thanks to the Chromium developers and projects. So I thought that was definitely really good. Um, I know we're not covering Chrome, but interesting enough that you would think that you would come in here and all the verbiage would say say the same except where it says chromium it would say chrome and then where it says uh open chromium open source project it would say google no in actual chrome at least last time i looked in the last six months it did also give a shout out to our open source developers over here at chromium um the other the other thing that i've i've, I've kind of got to give to firefox over chromium is that you know like I like I think I've mentioned in the past I uh, work in an IT department. Um, it's a relatively decent infrastructure, but it is a Windows house. Uh, we are in the future looking at changing that. However, in the meantime, we have things like SharePoint, which I, if you hear the word SharePoint, you're not familiar with SharePoint, decide to go look it up. Don't. It's it's a horrible product. But anyway, things like like Firefox, for example, integrates nicely into the Microsoft services. Now, you may sit down and go, whoa, whoa, whoa you're diving back into that proprietary. But, you know, what's nice about when you have a web browser that's multi-platform and you like that web browser and you use that web browser, um, it's nice to be able to go onto another platform and not have to use something like Internet Explorer. You could use Firefox and it integrates with all the functions of SharePoint and many of the other Microsoft products. Chromium and Chrome in itself does not. Um, so if you are in a house with a mixed environment or you work in a company with a mixed environment and they let you use whatever web browser you choose, that is something you will come across with Chromium is it doesn't tie in very well with other products. Um, the other area though, and let's see, because normally, maybe if I just go to Google, uh, and I don't know if it's going to make me have to sign in to be able to show it. If it does, that's going to be really sad because I don't want to show my email on here. Mm, I bet I can get there from here. Okay, we probably go in here. It's going to render the same. Chromium, and I don't know if it's the same website, just based on what web browser hits it, if it changes. Um, when you're signed in under Chromium, just like on Chrome, you have full access to their app store. Okay, and, and instead of saying Chrome Web Store, it would say Chromium Web Store. Um, I don't use it very often, but this is the bread and butter of Chromium. If you are a huge web app person, you get on your PC, you open a browser, and this is what you do, then this is where Firefox is really beat. They don't have a great place to go find uh, Firefox apps. I know that on the phones, there is the marketplace. And I think if you sign in, there is a marketplace for Firefox, but it is nowhere near the level of what Chrome has done here. It's very simplistic. You have apps, you have games, okay? Um, now, we're gonna go over a downside of this app store. So before you see games like Soldiers Inc. AVP and that it possibly may have amazing graphics, we'll go over a problem here. Um, extensions, so you can come in and get all sorts of extensions. And like I said, I mean, even Firefox is moving to an extension-based system. Um, so, I mean, essentially this is the way where everything is definitely going. Um, and then the themes, uh, the themes have definitely gotten a lot better. And um, I believe you can search for themes, but like I said, the themes, Red, Red Fox Snow theme. Uh, I'm not going to point out how ironic that would be as a Chromium user, right? But anyway, um, the themes in uh, Chromium are really no different than the ones for Firefox. I just have always had an easier time finding themes that I actually like in Firefox. So that's definitely a thing. Now, let's go back to the downside to the store. Games. One of the problems is with how these games are oftenly built uh, with Chromium is a lot of times they require under the certain underpins in the operating system to be present. Uh, and so you run into this issue where you see a game where the graphics are kind of like that banana project one that I showed you, right? The banana bread project. But they require, there's some proprietary code in there that relies on a Windows backbone to actually operate. Um, so that's... That's the only thing you'll oftenly find is you'll find really good games in here don't run under Linux. 
Now, I mean, someone could say, well, that's just Linux, period, you know, but, and, you know, if you don't play games and you're like, yeah, who cares? But for someone who's, you know, you get those people with all the freemium games on their Android and iOS devices that are sitting here going, I could do this in my browser on a nice big, you know, uh, 13, 14, 15, 17 inch display. Yes, yes, you could, but you will, in my experience of going through, now, if you don't mind, like the old Nintendo, Super Nintendo style games, uh, Game Boy style games. There's a lot in here for you. There's a lot of RTS. So there is that. Um, overall, the store is quite excellent. I've gone through, I found very um, excellent uh, web applications in here. Um, the only reason why I don't explore the store very often is I still feel the physical installed application is king every time. You know, you're always limited with the web applications on how much of a file you can upload. And, oh, now you need a premium account. Well, let's set you up with a monthly reoccurring fee. So, I mean, I see Chrome's great, Chromium's great, you know, endeavor into this direction with Google. And and it's great, but it's still, I'm sorry, if you're you're on the PC end of things, just install a piece of software. Either open source or if the open source tool doesn't work and you do have to use some proprietary paid software... Most of us, I think, would rather pay one to two hundred dollars for a piece of software than to turn around and simply pay a reoccurring nine ninety nine a month. I could be wrong there, especially if it's a software you use a lot. You know, maybe once or twice, yeah, I could see paying nine ninety nine. But if it's something I'm going to be living off of or in oh, quite a bit, then I'm typically going to opt for, um, you know, a paid program if there's nothing open source available to me. Okay. Um, now we're going to shoot over to the Wonders of Midori, which I believe, and I could be wrong, is this one. Yes. So right off the bat, we'll get back to that score, I guess. Um, anyway, Midori is a lightweight and fast and free web browser. and was actually one of the, the first videos I ever covered was reviewing Midori because I remember the first time I'd used Midori, I was like, oh, my God. This browser is simple, which is something I care, don't really, you know, I don't care if it's a complex web browser. I use a web browser to view a web page. As long as it can do bookmarks and tabs, I'm happy. Um, it, it, it was so fast. It was by far the fastest web browser I had ever used. I actually didn't realize, I mean, I knew there was a little bit of lag difference between, say, Firefox and uh, Chromium, but I didn't realize how fast a web browser could speed up your experience. Um, so, you know, built with HTML5 and CSS, WebKit, open source, small and mighty, uh, simply beautiful. Um, and I believe that the elementary, elementary OS team uh, builds, develops, and maintains uh, Midori. If they don't, I do know, uh, and I can't remember his name, there's one of their developers who, if you go look at who's involved with Midori, he's one of the prime guys for it. Um, and I get it, you know, if, for some people, they don't need this huge web browser, right? And then all about privacy and available almost everywhere. Okay. And they are right on that. I don't think they ever got around to porting to Windows. Um, but Elementary, Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, Mint, Mingia, Arch, Seuss. And you know, that's pretty, that's a pretty impressive little number because like nine times out of 10, when I go to a website, like a lot of times I won't see them, them distinguish a difference between Ubuntu and Mint. Now, many of you will say, well, there is no difference. You, you install the PPA the same and or the package pulls down the same and installs the same. This is truth. But to new people to Linux, they don't know there's a difference between Ubuntu and Mint. I mean, I remember at one time when I very first came to Linux, like in the first three months, I was using Ubuntu and then I saw this thing called Fedora. I installed it. Well, this was back in Gnome 2 days. I remember sitting there going, I'm so lost because they look the same. I mean, there's differences in like, oh, this has a Fedora logo on it. This has an Ubuntu logo, but they looked completely identical. Um, it wasn't until later I understood, well, they have different package managers there. They, they have um, maybe, you know, different Linux kernel versions. They are maintained by two separate entities, all these different things. I didn't know this back then. So for new people to Linux, it's kind of nice that they did distinguish into this end. Um, and then if there is anything that uh, syntax differences that I need to know about, It'll probably be present there. Um, and then features, we'll go over those here in a second. Uh, the biggest thing I love about this browser is its simplicity. I mean, look, at it's clean. It is so clean. A lot of the other, you know, Chromium is clean, but this looks even cleaner. And if you actually look at it, it looks like it works with my GNOME 2 desktop. Now that, or GNOME 3 desktop. Now, 
that shouldn't be very surprising being that Pantheon is a fork of Gnome. And there's some people I've heard argue, oh, no, it's not. No, it very much is. Uh, otherwise, why did the elementary OS developers post a ton of blog stuff about them going to Gnome conferences? That's like being a KDE developer and going to a, GNOME, a ton of Gnome conferences. I'm not saying that they maybe don't mingle a little bit, but you typically don't follow a summer of Gnome conferences when your, oh, your desktop of choice has nothing to do with it. Um, HTML5 test. Midori scored, I mean, we don't, we could pull up all the different numbers and see who, how close something got, but Midori actually scored the worst out of all of them. And if you actually go look at the, I think I have it pulled here, the wiki, one of the things that you'll notice, because it goes in, Midori did pass the ACID3 test, but if you notice, it has been steadily declining. Looks like it did a little better here than when they tested uh, in July. Okay, but you can see that it's been on the decline. Now, that's kind of not good. Uh, you're an open source web browser, and I mean like you preach privacy, you preach your 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 love for open source and all this stuff. You should be taking open source technology and integrating it better than anybody else in the business. Now, I know we're looking at all open source browsers today, but you know when you think about Midori, its fundamental core is it is a community driven uh, product. Whereas, you know, Firefox with the Mozilla Foundation and then, you know, Chromium, you know, a lot of its code base has come from Google Chrome developers. So, um, I, I mean, overall, and you can come in here, you can see like DRM support and media source extension is a no. Now I can understand why that's not there. Um, audio, speech recognition. Now, some of these maybe but see like this no this doesn't make any sense to me here but like some of these may be like uh you know html5 is recently recognizing some proprietary audio things and it's a smart move on their part i think because they realize that people who are making video and audio content oftenly are not going to open source their stuff so if you want it to be able to run on your code base platform you need to play a little 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 bit of ball uh, but you can go and if you're ever curious you just go to the html5 test.com and you can test your browser and then you can also see how other web browsers compare uh, but you can come in and see well, well what are the problems and maybe some of these things are possible uh, plugins that are missing however my arch system didn't it arch is really good about after you install a package especially from the main repository saying hey these are some available plugins so I could do some research to get this working um, but it's not that big of a deal to me so see like certain things here it got knocked off for um, gamepad control pointer events but you know and I know some people are like ah access to the webcam I don't want to have access to my webcam I get that. That's fine. It's just there is a part of the HTML code that supports that function. And it doesn't work in Midori, at least not without maybe doing some research and plugins. Um, and then the flash test I wasn't able to do. Because um, even though Midori can use the Firefox Adobe Flash plugin, I have to do quite a bit of work to get that going, I guess, under Arch because it's installed, restarted the browser, did not pull it in cleanly. Firefox did, but Midori didn't. Okay. Um, now, let's go look at preferences. Now, this is, I think, the bread and butter and icing and cake and all the wonderful desserts out there about Midori. Okay. It's simple, but there's a lot you can do in here. Start up. You can tell it. How do you want to start up? You can go mess with your fonts. You can mess with the behavior. Example being, I enabled spell check, spell checking and enabled WebGL support. You know, you can come in through all of these excellent tools and even have great control over your privacy. And the extensions do, we'll get back to extensions. And then you have your file types. Okay, and I'm sure I'd be willing to bet there's ways to add file types. So let's go look at extensions. The extensions you can kind of, you, you have a lot there. I have, I've, there's, I think, none enabled by default. And I've gone in and I've done like advertiser blocker 2.0. And I remember an advertiser blocker was only 1.0. Um, Gnome shell integration, Java plugin. Um, mouse gestures, um, let's see, was that it? Oh, web media now playing, okay. 
So anyway, there are all these plugins. I know they're actively being worked on because there are plugins that used to be here that are no longer here. And there's plugins here that I don't remember from the past. So the plugins are very there. The only problem is I don't know how developers go about getting additional plugins put in uh, or if the Midori project is trying to keep plugins on a very tight lockdown, which I get it because you say simple, light, fast, weight web browser. However, you put too many plugins into the mix and then people start saying your browser is slow and sluggish. Well, it's not really your fault. It's the people who put the, you know, 1800 plugins onto their machine. So they may want some control for those reasons. The other thing I found interesting was the DuckDuckGo uh, search engine. So, um, like I said, pretty fast, right? Um, it, 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 like I said, results for Linux, whoops. Um, DuckDuckGo, in my opinion, is very, rel is very relevant. I mean, honestly, I would say DuckDuckGo falls somewhere in between Google and Bing in terms of relevant searches. Uh, the only thing I have found interesting, and we'll see if it shows it or if they've revamped it a little or they've added it. At one time, DuckDuckGo's image result searches were actually coming off of Google's. Uh, was actually coming off of Google, but it used to actually say that. Now it looks like maybe they finally have built that function in. I, I love DuckDuckGo. I just don't use it because, like I said, it's not as good as Google. And nine times out of ten, I wouldn't care. But yet again, when you're writing a college paper, you kind of want to get to the bread and butter as quickly as possible. I definitely think uh, DuckDuckGo could become a future search engine for me um, once I get out of college. But right now, not so much. So anyway, I mean, Midori is excellent, right? The downsides to Midori, the ones that I have come across um, is to me, and I'm going to say this, and I know some of you are going to wish that the mighty Lenius Torvalds smites me where I stand, is it gives me too much of a feeling of Internet Explorer, okay? Now, what I don't mean by design. There in no way, shape, or form by design does it resemble Internet Explorer. Actually, maybe more of a safari in that case. Yet again, explains the elementary OS developers. Um, no, what I'm talking about is like, you know, I when I first started my job, it's been a long time since I'd used Internet Explorer. And I had to use it for a little while until I started using Firefox there. And one of the things I encountered with um, Internet Explorer was that it was actually, in my opinion, the fastest web browser on the market. And... Um, at times, about 50% of the time, it would hit web pages and just like die or come to a complete halt or super slow. And nine times when you read the documentation, Internet Explorer claims, oh, it's 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 their it's their fault, the, the people who built the website. And maybe that is the case, but at the end of the day, who cares? Chromium and Firefox and all these other web browsers are consistently the same speed. And that was the thing with me and Midori. Midori is the fastest, even to date, the fastest web browser I have ever used. I wouldn't say 50% of the time, I'd say about 60 to 70% of the time. But there are times Midori just hits like a brick wall and doesn't go, okay? I, I'm sorry, I hope I don't get like shunned for that. The other thing is the development cycle. I think Midori releases a new update, I think like every six months. Whereas your other web browsers are constantly releasing, I think it's anywhere from like four to six weeks or maybe as long as nine weeks. So to build your web browser and make a new release every six months, yet again, feels very Internet Explorer-ish to me. You should be releasing frequently. The web is a changing monster. You should not be standing still, my opinion. But other than that, I think Midori is an excellent web browser. It's just those two problems. So now it boils down to the real question which web browser won the battle of the open source web browsers? And you know what the answer is? None. Depending on what you do depends on which web browser is best. Okay. Example. And also, I mean, in all reality, it also boils down to uh, just how, you know, which one you may be a fanboy in this too. Uh, Firefox is really the best for, I think, the powerhouse user. And for the person who is actually having to work inside some Microsoft products, it integrates very nicely with those. It has tons of customization features. 
and is uh, like I said, they're changing. They're con they're evolving finally. Downside is you're stuck with older technologies in some areas, like Adobe Flash. Firefox would rather take the time to develop a mobile web OS for phone than possibly find a way to build a plugin that would support Flash Play, right? I mean, that's just how it is. It's kind of sad. Now, one would argue, well, Flash is on its way out. Well, allegedly, I mean, every two to three years, I hear someone predict a new day of death for Flash. Uh, you know, it was supposed to die in 2013, 2014, 2015. And here we are, and there's still sites using it. Um, but, you know, Firefox is good till 2017, at least on the Linux systems. On the Windows system, it doesn't matter. Uh, though I will point out, one thing I will, will really point out is, you know, like when I'm setting up an end user and I know they're never going to keep things up to date and one of their virus infections could be coming in through an out-of-date Flash plugin, a lot of times that's why people are going to push and getting pushed onto Chrome by IT folk is because it self-maintains at least some everything that ties into it. Um, Chrome, or in this case, Chromium. Chromium is has much better HTML support. Uh, eh, did about the same on Flash with a much newer version of the plugin, but it does have more simplistic UI, a, a steady use of UI. And at the end of the day, a lot of things that Firefox is changing to, Chromium has Chromium has been using for some time. So Chromium, in its own sense, is a little has been a little more cutting edge than Firefox. And at the end of the day, if you have a huge tie into your Google services, but you don't want to use that proprietary Chrome web browser because you're like me and you feel like, well, Chromium has, you know, some some auditing happening at some level. Okay, um, Chromium is the best browser for you. And then Midori, you know, at the end of the day, if you want a super fast web browser and maybe most of the websites you hit, you don't hit those speed slowdowns and you want one that respects your privacy. You know, one thing I didn't point out was to import and export bookmarks. Now you can do that in Firefox. You can do that in uh, Chromium. Well, I'm sure you can do it in Chromium. I've never tried it. But I mean, this is kind of cool, right? Say you have an own cloud setup or a C file server setup and you have all your bookmarks and every so often you'll export a new file into your server. Into your, into your home local storage. And the point is, it's right there in the open. Like many of your privacy functions are right there. It's fast, it's simplistic, it's private. That is a huge reason to um, use Midori. So at the end of the day, there's no good answer. I, it's like sitting down and saying, well, what's best, uh, what's better? Ubuntu or Fedora. Well, the last three or four releases of Fedora have been rock solid, um, but what you'll notice is a tendency of system admins will use Fedora and a lot of people who just want a Linux OS to operate uh, because they want a Windows replacement will use Ubuntu. Is one better than the other? No, I think it depends on what are you doing, what are you expecting, and what are you wanting is an outcome. And that's how the web browsers end up panning out, in my opinion. Um, I've used Firefox, I, I use Firefox, I use Chromium. Uh, I don't use Midori a whole lot just because of, like I said, I'll go to a site and it just, like, well, might want to go get a cup of coffee. In this case scenario, Midori, though for some, is probably the perfect web browser. I know some people who fully work in Midori. It's an excellent browser. Um, now, let me go back real quick before I kind of finish this up. And I wanted to talk about um, um, the what I found interesting is Vivaldi, I think, and I could be wrong, is using the same Flash plugin as my Firefox. Like I said, I could be wrong. They may be working with Adobe, but I haven't heard anything about Vivaldi doing that. And so say I take Vivaldi and I move it over, and then I grab my Firefox and I move it over. Um, but what's interesting is the benchmark numbers ma don't match up. So it's very interesting. I'm not sure if that has something to do with, uh, maybe the software does not accurately benchmark. Now I did run the benchmark two or three times per web browser and got a consistent number every time um, in terms of frame rate and my score and all these good things. Um, but the if you notice, Firefox did much better. So is it a question also, does how the web browser handles the Flash plugin? Very interesting, right? So, you know, I really hate putting out a time of when I'll make the next video because I don't guarantee it. I'd love to maybe do it next weekend, but then I get tied up at a job or, um, you know, family event or whatever, especially this time of year. So, you know, what I would like to do is at least say these are the topics that I will cover when I do a video and get those done. I did. I've been talking about doing a battle of the web browsers. 
And here we go. And the answer was, no one won. Everyone is awesome as long as it hits your needs and what you're trying to do every day. Um, the next two I would like to go over, because one is generating a ton of uh, news across the web, is Evolve OS, I think is the name. Um, Evolve OS is uh, this new OS that's Linux, but you know it's not like oh here's one it's based on Ubuntu. No, it is in it's an independent developed with a custom desktop yet again GNOME three fork. Um, very interesting, and I'm hearing a lot about it, so I'm very curious. And well, and for the website, if you want to go look at it pre or play with it pre before we talk, is how awesome is it? Well, it looks pretty awesome. Uh, the next video, uh, whenever I get around to it, I would like to go over virtualization. Do a, uh, you know, GNOME boxes virtu versus virtual box. Uh, there are some disturbing news out there about virtual box in the last year. Um, but there are some things that when I go into GNOME boxes, I sit down and go, man, I really wish I could bridge this network without having to open up a configuration file. Um, so there is that. And then one of the things I've been really looking into, and obviously it hasn't caught my interest too much because you didn't see it running on my desktop, um, is uh, PC-BSD. PC-BSD. Uh, I've been seeing, you know, I have a, a Flipboard app on my phone, and I have open source and Linux is actually my top two categories that I go into and read. And I've been reading a ton of articles of Linux users switching over to PCBSD or just the BSD distributions, period. Um, PCBSD is probably the easiest one that would be for a Linux user to switch over. Um, many of the syntax are very similar, but in terms of graphical installer and so on, uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot better on PCBSD. Um, I'm seeing that. I've heard super, super uh, positive things about... Uh, uh, the BSD community and many of the uh, how they do things right whereas in Linux we typically do something wrong and then do it right yeah. and I know some people are like oh this is going to be a bash Linux session no it's not the thing that's interesting about BSD is they're a very much smaller community so when they go to make a decision we don't have the battles of upstart and systemd you know, is a good example of, oh, it took us forever to figure it out. They quickly moved over to SystemD. Um, sitting down and going, Wayland and Mir and X. Uh, I don't know if they've reached a conclusion on that yet, but I'm sure when that subject matter hits, because of being a small community, hey, let's just go this way. Okay, that makes sense. Whereas in Linux, I think we're still, I think Wayland's the clear winner between the, the um, display managers. But the question is, is how long will it take to remove X? Because like right now, X does everything I want it to do. Uh, there's some things that I know Wayland will fix for me, but it's not a big deal. So it'll be very interesting. I want to look at the PC BSD. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope maybe there was something I did cover. If there, you know, showed off some things, showed off, you know, some of the endeavors of what Firefox tried in terms of showing HTML gaming, uh, you know, looking at uh, Chromium, its app store, and then looking at the simplicity of Midori really helps some people sit down and go, okay, yeah, yeah, this web browser is probably best for my needs. Pointing out some of the things like, well, Firefox got an old Flash player, Chromium, you have an up-to-date Flash, uh, but some of these Flash testers are showing that Firefox is still has a faster Flash uh, playback. Um, you know, Midori, yeah, if you want to use Midori, you got a lot of work to do to get it going, but it's an excellent web browser. And if you're not on Arch Linux, um, when I've used Midori under Ubuntu, it's a pretty, the, the Flash integration is pretty solid. So, but everyone, thank you for watching, and until next time, have a good one.